Hello again, Madam Chair. I'm Thank Hugh you. Tilson, an alternate delegate to your house, as you know, from the uh, Academy of Pharmaceutical Physicians and Investigators. I sure wish pharmaceutical medicine had done a better job of jet lag remedies, don't you? Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for this and for making the effort. It makes all the difference to us and, and particularly to remind us of the inherent nexus and shared ownership of the health of people between personal health services and population health services. I commend you as chair and the American Medical Association for the resolution that you passed presented by the Section Council on Preventive Medicine this year, uh, reaffirming that the practice of medicine includes the treatment of individuals and populations, said she simultaneously. Thank you so much for that leadership. You're welcome. My pleasure. You can't be one and not the other. It can't be. They're all together. Uh, and to that end, uh, thank you also for commending us for finally moving ahead, finally moving ahead on accreditation. About time, and we're going to get there. Uh, and uh, as you know, our accreditation is built on the ten essential services of public health. The seventh of which is that the agency responsible for public health is also responsible for assuring access to quality assured personal health services for all citizens of its community. We're working hard on those metrics to be sure that we can identify how the local health department is interacting with its local medical community. Maybe you'd opine on that briefly, and at very least I know you will accept my invitation to opine more publicly once those metrics get out there. Well, I would do anything you tell me to, Hugh, whatever you want me to do. Um, you know, I think that, to your point, and I, I sort of alluded to it a, a bit ago because I think there has been this somewhat deep chasm between public health and patient care. And I, and I think for some physicians in, the, in this country, it became more livid in front of their faces with H1N1 facing them because what they saw was the work on the ground with communities delivering H1N1 vaccine uh, in various parts of our country and it was amazing to me as I saw this data being presented at a national meeting uh, just right at the front, you know, the back, actually the back end of the peak of the epidemic uh, looking at the role of communities and it wasn't just uh, physicians, or and it wasn't just the public health department, it was everybody along the stepways to getting folks in there and getting them immunized. It's that model of local is everything. You know, local food is good, buy local, you know, health care is local, uh, public health is local, and I think we have got to somehow figure out the mantra that gets everybody marching to that same beat. You know, at the same time, I think even in our own community today, there is the lack of ability or recognition that that practitioner on the front line may be the first person to see the first case of something which for the rest of the country becomes very significant in our very mobile world in which we all live right now. And so I think in our local communities, we've got to do a better job of syncing the public health with the practice of medicine. And that can happen through the organized medicine structure. It can happen through an academic structure. It can happen through local government. But I think somehow it has to take place, and it's got to be built for that community. I do not think that you can rubber stamp any of this. It's got to be done based on what's happening in a local community. Yes, sir. I'm Paul Irwin from the University of Tennessee. I want to thank you again for, for being here. and really do appreciate your comments. I'm curious as to how the AMA is, is responding to the enormous change in the political landscape from last year's election, um, the majority of whom seem to want to do everything that they can to reverse the or to overturn the Affordable Care Act. Um, how, are you, how is AMA responding to that and, and what is your outlook? The American Medical Association took a distinct posture in supporting the Affordable Care Act. We knew and we know that this is an imperfect piece of legislation. There's bad stuff in it. However, not bad stuff, just not good enough stuff. The, the bottom line here to do nothing, to say, no, we're not gonna support this, would have been the worst possible thing for this country. And I would stand by that to my dying day. Now, having said that, our role going forward has been 
we have got to change some of the things within the legislation that are not good for medicine and not good for patients and not good for the healthcare delivery systems that deliver them. And those are the things we can change. There are things that need to be changed about medical liability reform. But we've been fighting this battle for decades, but we're in a much better place now than we've been in a long time. Thankfully, due to the relationship of the American Medical Association and when, with members on both sides of the aisle in Congress. And there's some new legislation now coming out that will hopefully do that because medical liability in this country, defensive medicine, probably costs somewhere between 150 and 180 billion dollars a year. There's a lot of health care that can be delivered for 150 billion dollars a year in this country. So that's one of them. Medicare payment reform a huge issue. And in fact, members of Congress have said to me personally, I don't know how to fix this. You've got to help us. So we're doing it. Right now, the American Medical Association is convening a leadership group, a think tank group, which is going to present at the end of the day Medicare payment models, delivery reform models that will assist members of Congress in getting to the right place. The methodology they're using right now is flawed. It cannot continue to go on. We've got an issue with workforce problems. We do not have enough primary care doctors in this country. And it takes seven years to grow a doctor. They don't happen overnight. And we have got to figure out a way to make sure that the caps are off residency programs, that we can get the workforce out there that we need to provide the care. There are other items in there, but our position now, what we are doing is moving ahead with making changes. We actually got rid of, we, we got Congress to get rid of this ugly 1099 form which for anybody that ran a business of any sort, if you had, ex you had to fill out all these stupid forms, well, you know, that was crazy. It was a little extra money. You know, I think it was, I don't know how many billion of dollars. It's a lot of money. But we managed to get that out of the legislation because it was stupid. And, you know, sometimes it's important to get rid of stupid things, and it was stupid. So we managed to get rid of that. But the problem we've got, and everybody has to realize, the pie is only so big. And, you know, you can't, you don't want to take from one place and put it to the other because it's important in both places. What we've got to do in this country is that we have got to get control of the costs of care. And that can only come by um, partnerships, between all those entities involved in delivering care. The prevention piece, if we can prevent disease, it's sure a lot more cost effective than it is in treating disease on the back end, which is what we've always been doing. And so we've got to work on that. If we can save costs, if we can cut down on the dollars having to be spent, we can put it to the resources where it needs to be in prevention and wellness and make sure everybody is adequately and appropriately compensated for the care they give. So that's kind of my take on where we are right now. What's the political will out there? I think with the political party in power now in the House, there has been enough sand thrown into the gears to slow everything down. Uh, what I'm very concerned about is some of the monies that were labeled as written out there to go to something may not be appropriated. And the AMA has put, stuck our necks out now and said, you cannot take money out of prevention and wellness. You cannot do it. And, <laughs> and we've made a big issue of this, so we'll wait and see. Um, but I think that you know, we're in a better place than we were five years ago. And we've got to make sure that we, we take the best of this piece of legislation, we get the dumb stuff out, we correct the stuff that's not working correctly, and make sure the monies are in the right place to do the right job for the right people at the right time. Thank you.